Last year, foreign affairs correspondent Matthew Fisher unpacked his suitcase in most of the world's continents. As such, he has had a unique view on geopolitics and a similar outlook on what could unfold on the international stage in 2014. And he joins us for more on all of that now. Here's Matthew Fisher, international affairs columnist with Post Media, and I dare say, Canada's longest serving foreign affairs correspondent, still working today. Good well, for you. Yeah, an awful lot of them have gone by the wayside because there have been so many cutbacks, so I don't know if it's such a great prize, but I feel sometimes a bit like a dinosaur or the last man standing because there are so few people overseas for any of the companies anymore. It's a great prize and you should still wear it with pride because well, you are. Thank now, you. how much traveling did you do last year? You know, frankly, I think I did more travel in the past 11 months than at any time in my life, and that is an awful lot of travel because I've been abroad for about 30 years. Uh, it was just non-stop. There was the royal baby, there was the surprise about the Pope's abdication and the new Pope, Nelson Mandela's health, uh, the war in Syria, the typhoon in the Philippines, Russia uh, getting the Olympics. Uh, there were all of these uh, events and also Canada uh, leaving Afghanistan. Most of the fellows are already out of Afghanistan by now. We only have a handful really mm -hmm. left. So there. put a number on it. How many kilometers do you think you've traveled? It would be close to 100,000 kilometers uh, this year, and I'm guessing it was about 25 or 27 countries. Hmm. Do you get frequent flyer points? Oh, I do, but they're spread out, you know, because my travel is random and there's not great logic to it. I don't accumulate. The alliances help, but I, I, I don't have as many points as maybe some people might think. And I guess for a guy who travels all the time, when you get a vacation, you probably don't want to go anywhere, right? You want to come home? I spend almost all of my free time in Canada, if I can, either in Ottawa or when I get a chance, and it's harder even to get that chance, but to go to northwestern Ontario, uh, to places like the Lakehead. I can't call it by its new name from... Come on, I, get over I, it. I, I won't. I'm from Port Arthur. No, you're not. Uh, you're from, and, well, okay, you're from Port Arthur, but and, it's Thunder Bay and, today. Uh, I have relatives, uh, not many left, but a few still up there and in Sulacout, which is even further north. Okay. Let's stop in, if we can then, over our period of time that we have here, f uh, to a number of the places that you visited this past year, and uh, just check in. And I'm going to get your thoughts on some of these places, starting with Russia, because you did spend a lot of time in Russia. Let me put a few items on the table here, and then I'll ask a question at the end of it all. Uh, item, Vladimir Putin outdid Barack Obama on Syria. Item, Russia has granted temporary asylum to Edward Snowden. Item, Russia is hosting the Winter Olympics next month. Item, Russia felt Ukraine slipping away, made its views known, and Ukraine is not slipping away anymore. It's a much closer ally, at least for now. Here's the question. To what extent, as you look at these chess pieces on a board, do you see Russia trying to recreate its empire? Russia definitely is trying to recreate a semblance of its empire. Even Russians, I think, do not dream of getting all of the pieces back together again. But uh, they want to take what they call the near abroad back. And the near abroad certainly includes Ukraine. Uh, that was the country leaving or the republic leaving uh, the Soviet Union that hurt the Russians the most on an emotional level. It hurt them culturally. It hurt them linguistically. Uh, a, a lot of their trade, they really have, a, really have an affinity for and consider the Ukraine to be theirs. And that's the subtext, I think, to a fair bit uh, of what was going on there. They, they didn't have a problem with the notion that they were occupying a, somebody else's country? No, there was never any problem with that. Mind no. you, they didn't have that problem with the Baltics or the Central Asian republics. Any of the other 16 republic republics, exactly. Either, but there was always this special connection with Ukraine. Part mm. of it came out of the war and... Uh, uh, you know, there were the Ukrainian fronts and the Red Army fought a lot there. But historically, even before the war, uh, Russians have always viewed Ukraine as really their little brother. So the question for us is how nervous should we be about the fact that, as you say, Russia is trying to recreate something uh, akin to its imperial days? Well, I feel badly for the Ukrainians, those Ukrainians uh, who don't want anything to do with Russia. But we must remember the country is deeply split. Uh, half of the country wants to be with Russia and half of it doesn't. I mean, this is the political problem 
for Putin and for those uh, on the other side of People the issue. People in the streets sure don't but, want to be with Russia. No, uh, in the western Ukraine mm -hmm. and in Kiev. But if you go to Donetsk and uh, uh, places like that uh, in the east, if you go to the south, you will find uh, overwhelming support for Putin and, and Russia in those places. I don't think we should be worried about this. We should feel sorry for the people and we should try to see ways maybe to mitigate some of the effects of this. But it's really an, uh, an irritant uh, for us uh, rather than a big strategic item. Whether Ukraine has closer ties with the Euro European Union, that would be nice. But it's not uh, a decisive strategic question. You mentioned the EU and I want to pick up on that. And to that end, I want to read you something that Paul Wells wrote in McLean's magazine last month. He wrote, this month's events in Ukraine must be baffling to all the people who had a good laugh when the Nobel Committee gave the 2012 Nobel Peace Prize to the European Union. What a joke. Europe, we were told, is nothing but a bureaucratic swampland, a never-ending economic crisis. And yet, here are thousands of people gathering every night in Kiev's central square and across Ukraine to protest the Ukrainian government's refusal to bind the country's future to the European Union. Why? Well, if you get all your Europe news from London newspapers, it must be baffling. If you spend any time in Central or Eastern Europe, you get it. For 45 years, those countries' trade and diplomatic choices were made for them by Moscow, in Moscow's interest. After the Cold War ended in 1989-90, every single Eastern European country that had the freedom to make decisions for itself chose the West. They joined NATO first, then the European Union. That's how Paul Wells sees it. What do you see in 2014 on that front? Well, I think it's interesting they joined NATO first. I think these Ukrainians who want to get out from under Russia want to be part of the West. Really, the European Union is the vehicle, and it's what is closest to them. I don't think they see fantastic economic benefits in it. In fact, we see that Russia offers bigger economic benefits in the short term at a price at a big political price, but then the terms that the European Union could offer and will offer even in the future. Uh, but they want to be with the West. It's the idea not only of Europe, but of Canada and the United States. Philosophically, intellectually, their curiosity, everything is driven towards the West. The European Union to me is an extremely ineffective organization. It, it's a bit of a joke. It had terrible problems wrestling with the economic problems of its own membership. But it people, still hasn't people solved People still want in, Matthew. So Latvia little, is now in. The little countries want in, Steve, but the big countries want out. I mean, the United Kingdom, if they had a referendum today, Steve, uh, Britain would still see its place with Canada and the United States. And, of course, the United States far more than Canada. One more thing on Ukraine. Do you imagine in 2014... Yulia Tymoshenko will get out of jail and be in a position to uh, play a significant role in that country? Well, not play a significant role, I don't think, but uh, there's a chance she could get out. When you've got countries where the leader decides whether somebody should be in jail or not, where there is no rule of law, you can't think logically. And, of course, she probably never should have been incarcerated or even charged in the first place. But... Uh, these things are caprices. Khodorkovsky getting released in Russia. It had nothing to do with the Russian legal system. It was the whim of uh, the president of Russia that he was incarcerated in the first place, and it was the whim. And I think it's the same for Tymoshenko in Ukraine. Uh, I think you could flip a coin about whether she's going to get out or not. But I think her ship has sailed and she's not on it. I think there's a new leadership now in the Ukraine. Klitschko, the boxer, uh, mm -hmm. is a very big factor now. And uh, he will have no time for her. He sees himself as the leader of the movement now, and so do many Ukrainians. Let's move to China. In November, the country declared a, quote, air defense zone over disputed territory in the East China Sea. Japan, very angry about this. Do you see this as the Japanese see this, which is Chinese aggression? I certainly see it as the Chinese trying to state their position very loudly that a lot more of Asia belongs to them and will belong to them in the future than does today. I flew right over the disputed area the day, two days after uh, the zone was declared. And I flew in a Japanese aircraft, not a military aircraft, a civilian aircraft. But they, they sailed through. 
uh, it would take a, it would be a tremendous act of provocation for the Chinese to actually do something about this zone. The problem with all of this, though, is as more military aircraft go into a zone, mistakes happen. There's already, there was a couple of years ago, a big uh, problem between a, a Chinese aircraft and an American military air aircraft, so things can happen. The Japanese are very upset, but you have to remember the Koreans and the Chinese are very upset with the Japanese. Uh, they view the return of Japanese militarism, the fact that Japan's defense forces, which are technically not called an army, but are an army in every, in every other way. The, the Japanese have a very potent air force. They will be buying more aircraft uh, to become even more potent. They've got warships being produced. And there's an arm ra arms race taking place in Asia. They also have problems with Korea. The Koreans have problems with China, but the Koreans also remember all the problems they had with the Japanese. The fact that they have never had an apology that they consider worthwhile from the Japanese over comfort women, o over the way the Korean uh, minority even today is treated in Japan. There are all kinds of competing influences in Asia, but the biggest one, China wants more space. It wants more space for trade. It views the South China Sea as a Pacific lake, or that it should be a Pacific lake that belongs to them. And of course, the Americans don't want this. Uh, Malaysia doesn't want it. Vietnam doesn't want it. Japan doesn't want it. South Korea doesn't want it. The Philippines don't want it. The key for America is to try to get these disparate allies to get together themselves. And it's a real challenge for the United States because the Koreans and Japanese dislike each other so much that it's hard to forge a common uh, cause against China. But it will come, and I think eventually Russia will join it too because of Chinese economic activity in the Russian Far East. There's a tremendous amount going on in Asia. When you talk about trends, uh, we still get excited by some of the things that happen in the Middle East, and we should be because bad things happen. But China is, the whole game is being played in Asia. I spoke last year with you a bit about that. The, the shift is inexorable, and we make a mistake if we uh, ignore it too much, and also if we just want to do trade with China because there will be so many other issues. Canada will be participating in uh, huge war games this summer in the Pacific Ocean off Hawaii that, uh, that uh, China will regard as a provocation. Well, That's me, our little part of the puzzle, even though the Chinese have been invited to those war games. Let me ask you about something China's doing on the domestic front, and you tell us how you think that will have an impact on the international stage. They have relaxed their one child per family policy, which has been around for a very long time, decades, and they've made some changes to their welfare system. How does that how could that have an influence on what they're attempting to do internationally? Well, I think if they had made economic reform, serious economic reform, it would have a bigger effect. I think the one-child policy is purely domestic, and it will help them with the population because there's no policy that the Chinese people felt more strongly about and opposed than this one-child policy, even if they didn't want more than one child. Mm -hmm. It's tough. If somebody says you can't do it, uh, you, you don't like it. And that was a real problem with that. As for China and, and the rest of it and, and its international ambitions, it will be about what China does, I think, overwhelmingly with its military and how it uses its economy and trade. And already we see in some of the trade deals in Asia that China is a bully. I went to the uh, APEC meeting in... Uh, where was it this year, Indonesia. But I was in Malaysia a couple of days before when Stephen Harper went there to visit. And it was a complete Chinese show. Poor Stephen Harper arrived in a country that was bathed in Chinese flags because like Canada, the Malaysians want all this huge money from China. And even though while Harper was there, they signed a huge and important trade deal, a gas deal. Uh, it got lost. It, it got a couple of paragraphs in the newspapers because the focus of the media and the public there, as it is everywhere in Asia, is on China. And everybody, it, it's the same problem Canada has. Everybody wants to do business with China, but at the same time they want to rein China in and don't want China to tell them what to do, and they don't want Chinese warships going around. It's interesting, in the last few days the Chinese icebreaker 
is involved down in Antarctica. That's the very same icebreaker that unannounced standard Canadian waters a couple mm. of years ago in the Arctic Ocean. And China thinks it has a big role to play in the Arctic Ocean. China's tentacles are everywhere. The business deals they are making in Africa. Africa too, yes. Africa, it's huge what they're doing there. They're rebuilding the British colonial railway system for all of Africa, spending tens of billions of dollars just on, on that. And then closer to home, what they're doing in countries like Laos, uh, they're going to own that country lock, stock and barrel. Lock, mm. stock and barrel. And the United States and others are trying to get in. It's the same story in Burma, uh, where Canada hopes to get somewhere. But if you go to the northern half of Burma, it, it's awash with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of illegal Chinese immigrants, as is Eastern Russia. China is on the march in so many ways, in so many different places, and uh, it bears watching. Well, there have been a number of international observers who have said, and you're one of them, who've said, watch this Chinese-Japanese relationship, uh, particularly over it's the... It's key. Okay, so to that end, you'll remember this. 30-plus years ago, Ronald Reagan wanted to do a kind of a... An, I don't know what to call it, a rapprochement, an opening, a, a, a soothing uh, with Germany. And he did an event in Bitburg, in a cemetery in Bitburg, as a favor to Helmut Kohl, I guess, the chancellor, with the uh, idea being we're going to come together over something that was so bitterly dividing us half a century early over World War II, except that there were SS officers buried there and it became a fiasco. Prime Minister Abe is doing the same thing in Japan, is he and, not? Yes, sure he is. Is the same the thing Shinto happening shrine. here? And the same thing is happening, and there will be no rapprochement between China and Japan over this issue. They may agree Just about some other what's, points. What's the issue here? Well, the issue is that China or Japan wishes to honor its war debt and does so again and again and again. And for China, uh, the Japanese military represents Manchuria and uh, the extreme behavior of the Japanese military there. I know a Japanese woman fairly well whose father served in Manchuria. And I said, what did he tell you about the Japanese experience in Manchuria? And she said, he absolutely refused to speak about it, except to say, that was our darkest hour. But he never would go into any details. And I guess it was. It was an absolutely terrible occupation. Of course, the Chinese can't shake this. Uh, it hurt Chinese pride. Well, they want an apology, and they're not getting one. Well, they're not even yeah. getting close to an apology. In fact, the opposite is happening. Japan is declaring uh, uh, more and more that it belongs, the, the Japanese bought the islands from a private citizen that China now wants just to the south uh, uh, and west of Okinawa. So this is causing increasing tension as well. As well, and, and I see no good there. The thing that might save it is that, of course, there are huge, there's a huge trade relationship between these two countries at the same time. And so maybe that will keep both sides powder dry for a while. But there is a tremendous potential for conflict in Asia that I think uh, a lot of us ignore. It's not happening in the next few months, uh, not probably for the next few years, and I hope it never happens because it will be a doozer if it does. But uh, it, it is something we should all be worried about. Let's take a look at the uh, American-Chinese situation, shall we? And here's a quote from John Micklethwaite, who wrote this uh, in The Economist. He's the editor-in-chief there. For most of the past decade, the world has got used to the idea of influence moving slowly from America to China. The Washington consensus of democracy and free markets has given way to the Beijing consensus of authoritarian modernization. America's self-confidence has been battered, first by George Bush's clumsy war on terror, which gave democracy a bad name, then by the credit crunch, which did the same for Western finance, and finally by the dysfunctionality of Congress, which shut down the American government in 2013. China has become bolder about asserting its rights in Asia, while Barack Obama has seemed a defensive president, retreating from Iraq and Afghanistan, unwilling to guide the Arab awakening, and keen to outsource responsibility in other regions to local powers. In 2014, the balance will shift back. America will look stronger, and China will look less alluring. The question is whether the cautious Mr. Obama will use this to leave a mark on the world. He's calling America the comeback kid. What do you think? Sort of. Sort of? Why not sort more of. than that? Well, 
First of all, the premise that Obama is to blame for any of this is, I think, not a particularly sound one. A lot of this has been inevitable for the last few. It was humiliating for the United States, and nobody really caught it in North America, but that Obama was unable to go to the uh, APEC summit in a meeting that followed the APEC summit in Asia, which gave the new Chinese leadership all the running at that event. That hurt American interests abroad. But uh, the question going forward is, uh, if the Chinese manage their economy well, if the growth rates have dropped, but if they still grow, uh, I, I think that it remains inevitable that China will reach a point where it's close to the United States. Uh, talk about the United States coming back. I see no American comeback in the Middle East. Now America's talking all the time to Iran, and they're supposed to now have mutual interests because of problems between Shiites and, and Sunnis in the Middle East. But the, where was the United States on Egypt? Egypt still is per I was in Egypt a couple weeks ago. And uh, the country is, like these other places, deeply divided. I don't see America as the comeback kid there. Uh, America did nothing to alleviate Europe's economic problems. Where's the comeback kid there? Well, the comeback kid is in its growth rates. It's doing better in terms of growth rates and, and uh, unemployment rate is lower. these things, yeah, but it's cyclical. How long is this going to last? Is it something that will endure for 20 or 30 years? I would never count the United States out. It is a country that has invented itself, reinvented itself so many times. When people thought the Japanese and the Germans were going to do great. I remember going to Germany in the 1970s and the Schadenfreude, the Germans would... I have mock pity about America's economic problems. And so I'm not one who counts America out ever. And I think it's going to be a long time before China uh, reaches any sort of uh, level of uh, uh, equality with the United States militarily. But economically, it is still coming. The huge trade deals that are being done today are being done with the United States not even part of the equation. The United States might get back some of it through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TTP, so, uh, TPP so-called. Uh, that may get them back in the game a little bit. But in Asia, the Chinese are signing these staggering deals uh, with all kinds of countries there. And in Africa, they're signing these deals. America is not even a player in... We did a big one this year. Canada yeah. has done... Uh, a big one in Europe, yep. and Canada did, uh, did a big one in Asia and may this year do some more in Asia. Canada hasn't done that bad as a, as a small power. Well, you, you were here a year ago. This has become kind of an annual visit to our parts, and you said uh, within a couple of decades you thought Canada had the ability to be the second most powerful Western nation in the world. I still believe that, yeah. but, uh, but the thing that continues to hobble us is our lack of confidence. Our lack of confidence in what? The fact that we are a great nation. The fact that we have one of the world's best economies. Uh, we always want to talk about the kumbaya aspect of Canada. I, I see this coming back with the liberals and, and the new democrats, that somehow we're not respected in the world any longer. And it's going to make a difference if we uh, uh, recreate CEDA and things like this. I don't see this at all. The way you get credibility in the world today is to be an economic powerhouse or to be a military powerhouse. Well, we're never going to be a military powerhouse. I think we can do a more credible job of funding our military than we do. But economically, we still have what the world wants if we have the confidence. But when I read surveys where Canadians say often in these surveys that we don't need the tar sands, we don't need the Northern Gateway and getting our natural gas out that way. I go, how do you think your kids are going to get educated? Where is our tax base going to be? How do you see us going forward as a nation if we are not a trading nation in the things where we have a decided advantage? Well, because we are not sharp enough and there aren't enough of us to compensate for the huge losses there by doing things in other economic areas. We will slide down to the bottom. And this is where it's a lack of confidence. Uh, and nobody in any political party 
presents an image of Canada as a great nation going forward. They always say, oh, we don't want to be the well, United States, but we okay. can do this without being a military force. But, but all right, you've talked Canada, you've talked military, let's talk Afghanistan. We're leaving Afghanistan in March after long commitment there. Uh, wh how would you rate the health of the enemy that we are leaving behind there? The uh, Taliban is very weakened. But the problem remains that Pakistan continues to shelter them. Pakistan, a country that was our putative ally uh, and the ally of the United States, continues to assist them. Canada never, and NATO never really made war in Afghanistan against Afghan interests. It was against people from outside Afghanistan in so many cases. Uh, and. Uh, I worry for going forward, I think the, the report, the intelligence report that the American newspapers had a couple of weeks ago about how things will be lost by about 2017, unfortunately may be true, but tremendous progress has been made there. We are going to th throw it all away because we have not stayed the course and because we never found a diplomatic remedy to rein Pakistan in. So we should not be leaving, in your view? We should not be pulling our troops out? No, I wouldn't say that because Canada has contributed a lot and been there a long time. I think if you want to speak about it in terms of Afghanistan, we should stay. If you want to speak about it in terms of Canada, I think we've done our part and we should leave. Uh, to me, they're different things. I understand, what but the gains... The, the, the gains the that gains you think will we've be made lost. will be lost. They will be lost. Hmm. And yet, what I don't like today is the idea that there haven't been gains. This idea that has been put forward by uh, one or two journalists and one or two commentators, that Afghanistan is worse off because Canada is there, is ridiculous. Just, it is ridiculous in the extreme. Uh, if you want to look at public health, if you want to look at the fact that uh, kids are going to school, and that girls are going to school. And then it's not 50 or 500 or 5,000. It is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of kids. That is progress. And we didn't go there to save the Afghan kids. We went there to fight Al-Qaeda and Taliban. But one of the ways to fight them is to educate the population mm -hmm. and make them understand that there are other ways going forward. Does it distress you, though, that Al-Qaeda is left there and just set up shop in Fallujah and now are basically in charge of Fallujah? Well, they were Where went they in, weren't before? They went into the police station in Fallujah, Steve, where I was one day with the New York Times it's reporter. It's in Iraq. Yes, sorry, it's in Iraq. Uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of years ago, I was in the very police station that they torched, and now they're running the show. The tragedy there, of course, is the population in Iraq don't want anything to do with them. And the population in Afghanistan wants nothing to do with the Taliban either. Every survey, every informal conversation I have with Afghans say they want nothing, even in the south where the Taliban is stronger. The population don't want to have anything to do with them. Those are the people we are abandoning when the West leaves Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is a great tragedy. Uh, when I look at all those Humvees and all those armored vehicles that the Americans are chopping up right now in Afghanistan, they're chopping up thousands of vehicles. Many of them never even got uncrated and used. Uh, hmm. I mean, it just, uh, it is staggering. Canada is leaving behind a lot of material because it costs more to bring it home than to, leave than to it keep there. it there. There are lots of messes there. But the underlying thing is the Canadian forces arrived, they had trouble with intelligence and were in over their heads in 2006, 2007, no question. But by 2009, partly or largely because of the Manley Report, they got the means there to really achieve things. They had some very good military commanders. There were strategic gains. The population was much happier and safer in the South. Canada really did achieve something. And the fact that today there are people in Canada saying that we made the country worse, it, it outrages me and it outrages others that I know who know anything about the situation. Okay, but a couple of minutes to go here. I want to uh, touch on uh, yeah, one or two more things here. As you look at the map of the world in 2014, where do you see the enemies of the West, in particular, making their home? The Middle East is a cauldron, and Al-Qaeda, and what is Al-Qaeda? It's an amorphous organization. Anybody can hang up their shingle and say they belong to the darn thing. 
But Yemen, the Sudan, uh, parts of the Maghreb, and of course Syria, are just terrible, and we're starting to see the consequences in Lebanon. Would you expect to see the West or Western nations or troops making any greater intervention in any of those places? No. The West is sick and tired of the Middle East. The focus, I believe, and I believe the focus of Western countries will be increasingly on Asia. But because horrible things will happen in the Middle East, because Iran uh, has a potential in the future for nuclear weapons, uh, we will c continue to get sucked back into the Middle East. The problem for the West's interests, I believe, with that is that while they do this, China is like the little kid in a weight room. It's just buffing itself up and getting stronger and stronger. It has none of these imperial responsibilities, and so it's making these big trade deals in Africa and across Asia. And the United States ends up ex uh, expending extreme amounts of political capital and goodwill and money and blood in all of these places and the rest of the West sort of follows along Canada too behind them. And I am very afraid that although we won't commit troops that somehow we will get diverted in the Middle East. We have to keep a watch on Al-Qaeda because they have plans, they have designs on Europe mm -hmm. too. And after that, who knows, but they want to set up a caliphate that covers an, an immense amount of territory. So I know we have to watch it, but we must also not forget that ch China, and I don't think we need to contain China or anything, but we have to pay attention to China. We have to nurture that relationship as best we can, and we have to make it a relationship that is more about uh, than about trade and to get China to behave responsibly, responsibly. And if we keep going back to the Middle East, terrible things are going to happen there this year. The repression of the Egyptian government, its plans for those people who believe in Islam and uh, are very serious about in e Egypt, those people are going to be treated very, very badly in the coming year. Uh, Lebanon could fall apart. All of this will entrance us and it will be terrible. And we have to somehow find a way to do this without committing too many resources mm. so that we can start to manage some of the other problems. It's a real dilemma for the West because they're spread so many places. You've got Vladimir Putin in there stirring the pot just for fun, I think, a lot of the time. Uh, not for any good, but just because he's able to do it. A and meanwhile, China gets stronger. You remember that movie, Around the World in 80 Days? Yes, sir. You just did it in 33 minutes. Well done. Well, thank you, Steve. That's Matthew Fisher, we always appreciate your visits to our studio, which have become a kind of an annual thing. He's Canada's longest-serving foreign affairs correspondent. You can read him in Post Media News. Thanks so much, Matthew. Great to see you again. Happy New Year, Steve. To you, too. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.